Yeah, Anusha, can we start? Yes, Doctor, let's start. Good evening, all. Uh, I'm Dr. Nikhil Paul. I'm a mentor at Study Medic for the Study MRC in program. Uh, I'm an emergency physician and currently working in KMC Mangalore as assistant professor. So the idea about to, today's session is all about to give a quick review about the microbiology part of MRCM primary. Uh, as you know, microbiology is a very vast subject and uh, um, but then for the MRCM part, uh, not the vast majority of questions are asked, but then they often uh, get, get restricted to common infections and some basic principles. We'll try to cover a few questions and a few topics in the microbiology part. And uh, we'll also have a uh, introduction to our own courses as well. Uh, we'll try to keep it interactive. I have a few questions for you so that you can uh, answer or you can even put in the chat box as well. So uh, going ahead. Start with the court for the day by Rabindranath Tagore. You can't close the sea merely by standing and staring at the water. You need to get into the water to start. So we'll start with a question. So anatomy barriers to infection includes all except open to answers. If you want to unmute and answer, that was fine, or you can put in the chat box as well. Am I audible? Yes, doctor. We'll wait for some answers. Okay, we lost someone. Dr. Rohit Tiwari, can you try it with the answer? Right, right, we have few answers here. Right, someone has commented uh, enzymes in tears or tight junctions between cells. But let's see the answer. So now answer is uh, mucociliary escalator and genitourinary tract. Where do you find mucociliary clearance? Mucociliary clearance is found in the respiratory tract usually. So then we'll go into seeing, uh, we'll see the barriers of infection. So we have few anatomical barriers of infection uh, where you can see in the eyes, you have a constant blinking tears or a lysozyme. Skin is an effective barrier of infection. You know that you get infected when you have a break in the structural barrier. Uh, so you also have uh, different secretions like sebum, which has this lactic acid, propionic acid, etc., which act as uh, barriers or uh, chemical barriers as well. You have the urogenital tract wherein the urine is frequently flushed by the lavaging action. You have the acidity of the urine as well. Now in respiratory tract, as we discussed, uh, we have the ciliary clearance, mucociliary uh, clearance. And then you have in GI tract, the stomach acidity and the normal flora with frequent peristalsis, which amount to the anatomical barrier. Next question, a pathogen is defined by all these options. 
is this a virulent microbe or a microbe which produce exotoxin an obligate intracellular bacteria or an organism that is capable of causing a disease what do you think it is Yeah, we got few answers here. Yeah, exactly. Most of them commented it's option E. Let's see. It's an organism that is capable of causing a disease. Let's see a few terms, which is commonly confusing. Colonization is not an infection. It's a normal state and it's not pathological. Pathogen, as we told, is an organism which is capable of causing an infection. An infection is exactly described as a microbe-induced state of a disease. We have uh, different type of pathogens. An obligate pathogen, which is found in the host animal only in connection with the disease. As well as we have opportunistic pathogens also, which are found in healthy host animals, but which may cause disease in certain circumstances. <clears throat> Carrier is a person infected with a pathogen, but without overt disease. We have two terms, bacteremia and septicemia. Bacteremia is presence of bacteria in the bloodstream without clinical signs. And uh, septicemia is uh, bacteria multiplying in bloodstream with clinical symptoms. Now, we have various uh, pathogens, which include obligative, opportunistic, and accidental. Uh, so, obligative parasites, uh, pathogens include uh, your Clostridium, Actinomyces, uh, Mycobacterium, and Pseudomonas. Opportunistic include uh, Vibrio, Pseudomonas, and uh, sometimes Pneumocystis. And sometimes you get accidental pathogens like Neisseria as well as bacteria. You also need to know the normal flora. Skin has uh, Staphylococcus epidermidis. Nose has uh, Staphylococcus aureus. Uh, <clears throat> oropharynx has uh, usually the Staphylococcus viridens. And the gingival crevices has uh, an uh, anaerobes like Fusobacterium. And then uh, colon has uh, Bacteroid fragilis. And vagina has this usual yeast and uh, lactobacillus. Uh, mechanisms of pathogenicity. Usually it's carried out in uh, various methods or various steps, including adherence, evasion by phagocytosis, evasion of the acquired immunity, penetration and spread, uh, maybe immunological mediated injury, as well as toxins. Adherence, they use various uh, adhesins or various mechanisms by which they adhere to the uh, host cell, which includes uh, pili or a fimbria in case of gram negative, uh, uh, lipotechoic acid in gram positive and M protein, especially in streptococcus pyogenes. But pathogens uh, use various methodologies to evade phagocytosis. For example, in case of streptococcus and pseudomonas, they do it by inhibition of chemotaxis and complement by various factors present on them. Uh, they also have, most of them have the capsule. Uh, which is also called as a slime layer or glycocalyx. Uh, so this, they also produce some anti, they also hold some antiopsonins, uh, which uh, help in opposing the phagocytosis, which include M protein in case of streptococcus pyogenes and protein A in case of staph aureus. So in case of Neisseria, so the pili act as the anti phagocytosis. Now, evasion of acquired immunity can be, uh, they, they carry out in various mechanisms like antigenic variation. You have studied in this in case of influenza. So, intracellular survival in case of mycobacteria or listeria and production of certain proteases like IgA proteases, which includes Haemophilus influenzae, uh, Streptococcus, Neisseria gonorrhea, and Neisseria meningitis. 
uh, as we discussed the antigenic variation is found commonly in uh, influenza they uh, reassert their genomes causing antigenic shift as well as in hiv virus they a uh, high mutation rate causing antigenic drift as well as in nisseria and enterobacter next method is by penetration and spread by producing various uh, enzymes or various proteases and other factors like collagenase which breaks peptide bonds in collagen hyaluronidase or uh, lecithinase as well as streptokinase or streptodonase so streptokinase is uh, dissolves fibrin produced by streptococcus pyogenes um, streptodonase breaks down dna released by dead cells and produces the viscosity of the pus in streptococcus species now immunological mediated injury which include acute inflammation which uh, and chronic inflammation which you are familiar with as well as hypersensitivity reactions when we talk about hypersensitivity reaction let's see this question post streptococcal glomerulonephritis is characterized by or which type of hypersensitivity can be seen here <clears throat> any answers yeah we got an answer here yeah more answers coming in right so got a right answer in fact so post streptococcal glomerulonephritis as a type 3 hypersensitivity so follows a hyper type 3 hypersensitivity exactly here you can see immune com immune complexes of antibodies that's the type 3 hypersensitivity antigen antibody uh, complexes uh, streptococcus biogen serotype m12 and 14 circulate with the antigen and block small diameter of blood vessels causing glomerulonephritis so we have other hypersensitivity reaction also uh, reactions also in certain infections Uh, so helminth anti uh, so the helminth uh, infections can cause uh, allergy and type for which follows the type one. Uh, in case of type four, uh, so in tuberculosis, leprosy or chlamydial pyelopiaides, you can see there is cell mediated immune response against the infected cells, causing damage and granuloma formation. So next. we bacteria produces or there are two types of toxins by which uh, pathogenicity is established we have endotoxins and exotoxins uh, endotoxins as we know it's a part of the outer membrane of gram negative bacterium so it's usually found after the bacteria is dead actually so it's heat stable and cannot be converted into toxoid its active component is lipid a uh, released after the death of cells Uh, the usual mechanism of action is binds to cd4 protein on macrophages and dendritic cells and uh, stimulates overproduction of cytokines so peptidoglycan ticoic acid fragments are also there which are released on death of the gram positive bacteria hemotactic for neutrophils as well we have exotoxins which are secreted toxins uh so they are protein sections so protein secretions of viable cells they have two components a uh, which is active and b which is a binding component uh, so it's easily inactivated to make toxoid vaccines so classified by their action specific action or the specific location which includes enterotoxins neurotoxins and cytotoxins there are cytolysins which damage membranes and lysis cells as well. now we can see various uh, exotoxins here produced by various uh, bacteria which include your uh, diphtheria toxin exotoxin a produced by pseudomonas aeruginosa and tetanus toxin produced by the clostridium tetani x most of them are converted into toxoids and for creation of vaccines no difference between exotoxin and endotoxin 
as we know, uh, so can be converted into toxoids, exotoxins, uh, and uh, it, exotoxin has high antigenicity and is heat labilized. Now, move on to the next question. The incubation period of measles virus is, any answers? We have more answers. Okay, so we have some answers here. Dr. Rohit has mentioned it as option B, 9 to 12 days. Is exactly so. Measles virus intubation intubation period is nine to twelve days. So we need to look into various intubation periods of uh, common viral infections. What we see, uh, we have the measles virus, which has an uh, intubation period of nine to twelve days, and uh, influenza, which is very it has a very short intubation period of one to two days. Uh, we have uh, adenovirus, which has five to seven days, and the incubation period can vary from one to two, to two days of influenza and up to uh, a long period in case of rabies or HIV virus. So common bacterial infections as well. You have gonorrhea, which has a three to five days incubation period, uh, as well as uh, Salmonella, uh, which has up to 72 hours. Salmonella food poison. Now we'll take a short break from all this microbiology. We'll come to infections after this. Uh, for those who are not much familiar with study medic, uh, I think some of you might be already uh, students or might have already joined it before. So study medic is a re company registered under Companies Act of India. We've been running this program for last uh, one year, uh, the MRCM program. But we have been the study medic have been running the other courses, which includes uh, MRCOG and MRCPCI program for quite some time. So and we have a great success rate as well. So we have uh, uh, comprehensive packages which include a course library and which consists of summaries, templates, mock exams, case discussions, question banks, forecasts, and videos. And our LMS is top-notch, wherein you can access all these things once you join the programs. And you will be always having a support of the mentors. And one more thing to tell about the mentors, we are having a, a good team of mem mentors, wherein all of them are emergency physicians, uh, qualified emergency physicians working actively. So they'll be able to deal with all and clear all your doubts and support you with your exams. So one thing what uh, everyone asked for, like how to prepare for this MRCM exam. So it's, it's a bit tricky actually. So most of you might be emergency physicians or might be physicians who are planning to come into emergency medicine field. So it's not uh, what you learn in the entire MBBS, what you have to prepare for this. So the MRCM uh, syllabus contains specific topics. Uh, mostly, they mostly restrict their questions to commonly found conditions or common protocols, which is found in, in the UK. So you need to plan and schedule your, and you might you might get a maximum of three to four months to prepare for each exam. You need to plan and schedule your sessions accordingly. And again, as I told, what to read is always confusing. So you need to follow a curriculum or which is like 
very focused on the MRCM exam. There is no point in reading a lot of theory. There is no point in uh, reading the Tintinelli or reading uh, your emergency medicine textbooks. Rather, you need to be, go for a focused learning. So we have uh, a good LMS wherein uh, we will be uploading all the sessions. We'll be having periodical sessions uh, every week or even uh, frequent sessions more than that. So all the sessions will be available as for recording as a recorded form as well, wherein you can uh, hear that again and again, practice yourself. Uh, you'll have questions almost daily and wherein you can practice and familiarize with the pattern. One thing uh, which people get confused is the pattern of the questions. So most of the questions might be confusing and most of the options you might be having a couple or, or, couple or three or one or one to three options which are very similar. So once you practice on a daily basis and get familiarized with the questions, you will be able to uh, clear the MRC very well. So you'll be having mentors as a constant support and uh, you won't be able, uh, you won't get into too much of stress as well. So uh, just few courses which are upcoming. We have a course, uh, a fast track course for the November 2023 session and a long course for uh, May 2024 session. So uh, for more information, you can contact the below numbers. You can just note down the below numbers so that you can contact accordingly. Or you can even uh, message the WhatsApp group. They will get you, get back to you. I will continue with the other questions. So we'll see some questions in the infections. Uh, these are the most common questions what they ask, uh, from which the topic from which they ask questions in microbiology. So let's see this question. A three-year-old boy is brought to ER with complaints of earache. You find a tense bulging tympanic membrane on autoscopy. Which one of the following is the antibiotic of choice? Yeah, more answers. Yeah, we got some answers here. Let's see. Yeah, exactly. So amoxicillin is the drug of choice. So we are dealing with an acute otitis media. So most of the time, the it is due to a viral infection. 50% of the time, maybe a respiratory syncytial virus or a rhinovirus. Sometimes it's maybe bacterial, which is caused by a streptococcus pneumoniae, hemophilus influenzae, or axilla, staph aureus, or streptococcus pyogenes. As we told, the treatment is mainly amoxicillin, or uh, in severe infections, go ahead with the amoxiclav, or if allergic, you can go with clarithromycin as well. Other infections pertaining to the ENT, uh, so you have ac acute epiglottitis, which is very rarely seen nowadays because of the hip vaccine, which was included in the immunization schedule. So it is caused by hemophilus influenza type B and the treatment, which include a ceftriaxone or a ceftriaxone. Uh, acute tonsillitis is mostly bacterial, caused by streptococcus pyogens. And sometimes it's viral, caused by rhinovirus, coronavirus, or uh, para-influenza, influenza A or B as well as adenovirus and HSV1 and Epstein-Barr virus. Let's see this question. A three-year-old boy is brought to ER with the condition as shown below. Which of the following is the most common causative agent?
Yeah, so we have the answer. Uh, sorry for that. So it's streptococcus pyogenes. Can someone tell me what was this condition? Can you try telling me what this condition is? Sir, it looks like erysipelas. Yeah, excellent. So it is erysipelas. So most common cause is streptococcus pyogenes as well. So we are one of the most common infections what we'll be uh, seeing in our ER is cellulitis. So as someone told the impetigo, impetigo, uh, is what is what we see over here. Here we have the known bullus impetigo, and here we have the bullus impetigo, and here we have this erysipelas. So erysipelas is basically cellulitis, superficial cellulitis, which is spread to the lymphatics as well. So now, uh, impetigo is usually caused by Staphylococcus aureus, and uh, sometimes group. A beta hemolytic streptococcus pyogenes as well. Or, and the MRSA is often found and sometimes found in uh, non bullous impetic. So, various co common causes of cellulitis uh, streptococcus pyogenes and Staphylococcus aureus. You have uh, cellulitis or erysipelas um, and some atypical organisms as well, which you find. Especially in bites, human bites, animal bites, and all, pastorella, uh, vibrio vulnificus, aeromonas, or streptococciniae, and uh, now, what was the treatment of cellulitis? We won't go deep into treatment of cellulitis, but antibiotic of choice uh, that you need to know that, that is based on the class of cellulitis. Uh, just going through the classes of cellulitis. Class 1 have no signs of systemic toxicity or uncontrolled comorbidities. Uh, can be discharged on an OPD basis. Class 2 uh, has a patient systemically ill or um, systemically well but doesn't have any comorbidities such as peripheral vascular disease. Class 3 patients may have a significant systemic complication such as acute confusion, tachycardia, tachypnea or hypertension or be unstable. And class 4 has a life-threatening infection such as necrotizing fasciitis. So uh, in class 1, uh, flucloxacillin is recommended uh, at 500 mg QID. Uh, for moderate, that is class 2 and 3 infections. Again, to flucloxacillin, uh, you need to go for a higher dose of 2 grams. For class 4 infections, you need to start with uh, intravenous uh, according to local guidelines or mostly benzylpensine and ciprofloxacin. So uh, for cellulitis from bites, uh, you need to go ahead with uh, coamoxiclav and it has a broad spectrum activity as well. For freshwater infections, especially this uh, mycobacterium infections, mycobacterium marinum, etc., you need to go ahead with uh, ciprofloxacin 750H. Or levofloxacin. as well. Let's see this question. 50-year-old lady presents to ER with complaints of headache associated with fever, headache, neck stiffness, and photophobia. She is confused and disoriented. Lumpar puncture shows a lymphocytic CS CSF with normal glucose. Drug of choice would be. Uh, we have answers here. Uh, now, what are we seeing? What is this condition? Viral meningitis. Yeah. 
so we are dealing with a viral meningitis so the drug of choice for acute viral or aseptic meningitis is acyclovir so various types of meningitis most of the time it's an aseptic meningitis mostly viral cause that is the most common form and it might be caused by a herpes virus or an enterovirus so you can have bacterial as well so which includes a meningococcal disease which is caused by a neisseria meningitis as well as a pneumococcal uh, which is caused by streptococcus pneumoniae as well as uh, you might have a tb infection especially uh, but very less in the uk uh, tb meningitis Uh, is often found in immunocompromised people, especially those are those who are having a HIV agent as well. Atypical infections like listeria is uh, uncommon, and uh, you can have also some rare meningitis like recurrent lymphocytic meningitis, which is also called as Mollaret's meningitis, which is caused by HSV two, that is herpes simplex virus two. So here. Uh, why how to identify whether it was viral or bacterial or tubercular so comparative chart is over here wherein you can find that uh, in bacterial it's mostly uh, neutrophilic predominant cells uh, and uh, the serum glucose levels are normal in case of normal or little bit increase in case of viral But the rest of the thing the bacterial tubercular or fungal it's used the serum glucose is sorry the csf glucose is reduced so that uh, the normal csf to serum glucose ratio is always the more than 0.5 so that is reduced in case of bacterial tubercular and fungal and the protein if they give the protein value uh, in bacterial tubercular and fungal it's Increase the protein CSF protein has increased, and in case of viral, it is normal or reduced. So uh, now the treatment for acute bacterial uh, acute meningitis due to various etiologies. So you can have bacterial meningitis. The mainstay of treatment is third generation empirical treatment with third generation cephalosporin. You also have to have add few other agents. So when you are suspecting few other conditions, so in case of bacterial meningitis, if more than fifty-five years, uh, you need to also add an ampicillin or amoxicillin, suspecting a gram-negative cover as well as listeria. In case of neonate, uh, you need to also suspect an enterococcus as well as listeria. Add with an ampicillin, amoxicillin. Uh, in case of fungal meningitis. uh we suspect in case of immunocompromise you need to add with amphotericin b or two cytosin tb meningitis uh apart from the third generation cephalosporin you need to add with the tb regimen which include uh accordingly the according to the protocol now in case of cerebral malaria causing a meningitis uh you need to add with quinine viral meningitis viral encephalitis or meningitis you need to go with with adding acyclovir as the most common cause of infective encephalitis is any answers C D right. So most common cause of infective encephalitis is it's herpes simplex virus. Yeah. So viral encephalitis is caused by many viruses, like in, which include HSV, adenovirus, arbovirus, enterovirus, as well as mycoplasma. Uh, so. uh maybe atypical as well as uh, mycoplasma so but most common is herpes simplex virus now let's see some other 
rare infections. The most common cause of infective endocarditis in intravenous drug abuses. What is it? Yeah. Do you have some other answers? Yeah, most of them agree to that. So most common cause of infective endocarditis in drug abuses is staph aureus. So uh, this is some data from uh, the UK. So here we have... Uh, uh, various causative organisms in uh, native valve, prosthetic valve, as well as intravenous drug abuses. There you can see that in intravenous drug abuses, the most common organism is staph aureus. And in uh, native valve, you can see that again, it's staph aureus along with uh, streptococcus. And in prosthetic valve, it's mostly coagulus negative staphylococcus as well as staphylococcus aureus. The most common cause of viral myocarditis. So there are many answers coming up. Is it influenza? Is it EBV? Let's see the answer. So it's enterovirus. So Coxsackie A and B uh, are the more, most common cause of viral myocarditis. Okay. So viral myocarditis uh, is, happens as a result of all these things. Uh, those are the other causes, bacterial and fungal causes of uh, myocarditis as well. But uh, the Coxsackie virus, A and B, amounts to most common cause of uh, viral myocarditis in the youth. So treatment, penicillin or cephalosporins are usually the first-line antibiotics. And in case of, if you're suspecting MRSA, or you can add up with uh, vancomycin or in case of allergy. Now let's see this x-ray, 38 year old man with complaints of fever, productive cough and shortness of breath. X-ray is shown below, which of the following organisms is most likely? I think most of you agree with this. So this is a typical pneumonia, community acquired pneumonia, pneumonia, and mostly community acquired pneumonia. And the most common cause of community acquired pneumonia is streptococcus pneumonia. So it's the most frequently identified pathogen, almost 39%, followed by chlamydia, chlamydophilia pneumonia, which is amount to 13% uh, of hospital acquired patients. But in case of community acquired pneumonia, that percentage is not known. And mycoplasma pneumonia occurs in epidemics. Atypical uh, infections or atypical pathogens like Legionella and uh, Staphylococcus aureus are also identified most frequently in patients who are admitted in the ICU. Treatment include amoxicillin 500 mg orally three times a day for one week. That is mostly in case of uh, stable patients. Uh, clarithromycin 500 mg orally twice per day for one week is an alternative if the patient is allergic to penicillin. You can add levofloxacin 500 mg once daily 
uh, for patients allergic to both. So now BTS guidelines, British Thoracic Society uh, guidelines recommend Formaxiclav 1.2 gram IV three times daily plus clarithromycin 500 mg IV BD for seven to ten days for intravenous uh, treatment. What is the most common cause of hospital acquired pneumonia? Right, we have some answers here. So, most common cause of hospital acquired pneumonia is Pseudomonas aerogenosa. So, usual common pathogens what you find in the hospital acquired pneumonia and ventilator associated pneumonia include uh, Pseudomonas, that is the aerobic gram negative bacteria which includes Pseudomonas, E. coli, Klebsiella, and Enterobacter species. You also find gram-positive, like Staph aureus, but the most common is Pseudomonas aerobics. A 28-year-old man with known history of sickle cell disease presents with history of known healing ulcer over his ankle. You are suspecting osteomyelitis. What is the most common likely positive age? Yeah. This is sometimes a typical question asked. So here the answer is salmonella. But overall, uh, you can see that uh, the cause of osteomyelitis in almost the all age group, the most common cause, causative agent is staphylococcus aureus. But in particular situations like chronic hemolytic disorders like sickle cell disease, you can find that uh, salmonella species also can cause. Uh, Osteomyelitis. So other causes include Staphylococcus aureus, as we discussed, Staphylococcus pneumonia, as well as Pseudomonas. Treatment include fluoxetine in case of stable patients, and if uh, serious infections like MRSA is suspected, you need to add with for vancomycin. You also need to add with fusidic acid or rifampicin accordingly. A 45-year-old patient came with complaints of lower abdominal pain, dysuria, and dyspareunia. You suspect PID. What is the most common infective agent? No, is this chlamydia or Neisseria? That is the most common doubt what people have. Now let's see the answer. It's it's chlamydia tracheitis. So the most common cause of PID in a sexually transmitted infection, which has uh, spread from uh, lower genital tract, and most common positive agent in group. Uh, chlamydia, uh, it's almost for 35% cases. Then we have the Neisseria and as well as mycoblast. For treatment, you have two regimens. Outpatient regimen include a standard dose of uh, IM uh, or IV ceftriaxone followed by oral doxycycline, 100 mgBD and oral metronidazole, 400 mgBD for 14 days. Uh, inpatient regimen include uh, uh, intravenous therapy, which include the uh, first line treatment as ceftriaxone 2 gram OD, as well as doxycycline 100 mg BD. 58 year old diabetic patient presents to ER with an acute onset of swelling of the left knee joint with associated fever. His uh, total count shows 15,000, as well as his ESR is 60. What is the most likely positive agent?
yeah there is no doubt about it this the answer is staphylococcus aureus so we are dealing with the septic arthritis septic arthritis typically has a bimodal distribution you find it in younger children as well as uh, people above uh, 40 or 50 year old uh, especially in uh, people have, who are immunocom immunocompromised and diabetes diabetics as well the so most common uh, positive organism identified across all age groups is staphylococcus aureus so you can identify by the symptoms including uh, if it's a child a limping child can't wait bear and as well as the investigations which include a raised total counts and a raised esr as well as crp with the presence of fever so treatment include fluoxetine as we deal with all staphylococcus infections and clindamycin if allergic to penicillin you have need to support with vancomycin in case of mrsa uh, if you are suspecting gonococcal arthritis or an anaerobic infection you need to add with cefotaxime as well as ceftriaxime uh, the questions are over and we'll just have one more infection to just to cover there are a lot of other infections as well but these are the most common infections that uh, uh, we come across so urinary tract infection as well in the majority of patients uh with this e coli uh and uh, you also find sapro uh, staphylococcus saprophyticus in case of uh, uh reproductive age group women uh and enterococci klebsiella as well as proteus account for the rest of the 5 to 10 percent so what to give for the treatment in case of cystitis which is uncomplicated and which is very stable patient is stable you need to go ahead with uh, either nitrofurantoin or you can add a uh, cefalexin as well uh, in case of uncomplicated pyelonephritis you go ahead with ciprofloxacin that is the initial treatment of choice with or without gentamicin case of acute complicated pyelonephritis need to admit start on with an intravenous treatment with uh, a broad spectrum antibiotics which include a, the prasilin tazobactam or a cipro, uh, with a ciprofloxacin or coamoxiflor in pregnancy cystitis again can be treated with cefalexin that is more stable uh, more safe and in uh, pyelonephritis cefalexin is the first drug of choice and ciprofloxacin is an intravenous option so we come to the end of the session for today uh if you have some doubts or questions we'll uh discuss you can free to ask some doubts about the study medics program as well no this is not the whole of micro so this was just an introductory session so that uh, uh, if you want to join further we are running programs you can come join our program uh, this is not the whole of uh, micro we are just uh, we have just touched few questions important questions so that that becomes useful to you as well of course you can ask ask about preparing exam you can unmute and talk so that we can uh, others are also benefited out sir is it enough to properly solve mrkm success online question bank uh sorry which question bank mrkm success 
uh, MRKM success, I cannot comment about uh, another program. Uh, so try, you can try questions from that, but then uh, you just need to cover up a little bit of other topics as well. Uh, MRKM success questions are uh, good. You need to complete that as well, but then you need to cover a few other part of theory also because uh, you may not uh, get a total overview by solving the questions alone. Because, Sir, uh, for physiology, I mean, what can we use for resource for physiology? Physiology. Yeah, for, uh, for, from our part, we suggest coming uh, and joining our program. We have our own resources. Uh, Of course, you can join, uh, you can uh, take the I mean, MRCM success as well. But then we have our own modules and sessions you can join in. You can check that out. You have some free sessions and the free modules in this website wherein you can access and see the questions and then you can join. Any more questions? See, you can see the uh, number being displayed. You can check the chat box. So feel free to contact anytime. We'll be able to guide you more uh, regarding the course and as to how to prepare and how to go ahead with the course. So always welcome. Any other questions? Anusha, do you have do we have other questions or we'll wait or we'll wind up? Uh no doctor. Shall we wait for some more time or we'll wind up? Uh, doctor, if the candidates have any other queries, they can ask here now. Uh, yeah, that's what. So. Doctor, uh, Doctor Hiba asked one query in chat box. Difference between oh. viral bacteria and something oh, like that. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. We will just, one second. I'll just see that. So viral and bacterial meningitis. Uh, so we have just seen the difference on the this LP and CSF examination. We will just see that. Uh, I'll just show you that chart once again. So as you know, uh, the viral, uh, so the bacterial meningitis, you can see a lot of proteins in the CSF. So bacterial meningitis as well as tubercular meningitis, uh, you can see a lot of proteins. Yeah, here you can see that uh, there are, you can find a lot of proteins in bacterial meningitis. CSF, whereas uh, in case of viral meningitis, the CSF sugar is normal, but in other bac uh, bacterial meningitis, the CSF sugar is low. So the C CSF serum glucose level is less than 0 0.5. 0 0.5 is a normal ratio of CSF to serum glucose ratio. And also uh, the main cell type in CSF, what you can find in bacterial meningitis is neutrophils. Uh, the uh, in viral as well as tubercular, it is mononuclear cells. And uh, the total counts in CSF is markedly increased in case of bacterial 
but in viral it is only moderately increased and tubercular it is again lesser I hope the difference between bacterial and meningitis and viral meningitis according to the CSF is clear. Now, causative agent wise, you know that viral meningitis is caused by uh, herpes virus as well as enteroviruses. And bacterial meningitis is caused by uh, Neisseria as well as pneumococci. Is that clear, doctor? In case of no further questions, we'll wind up. Okay, Dr. Thank you so much.